All right, if you haven't uh, been to the snack table yet, I'll uh, get you to make your way there quickly. Every oh, everyone's getting quiet, so I guess we'll just start. <laughs> uh, okay, it's been picked clean. Excellent. Right on. <laughs> well, it's good to be back. Back in the saddle this week. Uh, still still could remember how to prepare a sermon. Well, I hope I, I did. I guess you'll find out soon enough. Uh, but to start out this morning, I wanted to uh, begin with a little bit of a guessing game. And so I'm going to give you three clues, and you have to figure out... Uh, what, what the person or character is that I'm describing. So I, because I live in the house that I live, I thought we better start with the Pokemon. <laughs> yeah! Yay! All right. All right. Yeah, I know. To the adults, it's, it'll be like I'm speaking in code. But we'll... I didn't take Pikachu because that's the only one the adults know, right? So, okay. All right, so first clue. First clue is a normal type. Nope. Alright, second clue. Second clue. It can digest any kind of food. That was too that was too easy. I didn't even get to the third clue. No, no, it's Snorlax is is the evolution of Mudslax. That's right. It's it is Snorlax. That's okay. Alright, second second character. We're gonna get into real life real life person ish. Uh, so first clue, it's a name, a uh, person that's in the Bible, in the book of Psalms. You'll find them. It's not God. It's not David. Good guess. Second clue, it's also the name of a comic book character whose alter ego is Prince Adam. This is a, this is a deep cut. So it's, a, it's not a Marvel character. So that's... That's, there's an extra clue even. Okay. See, in, in, in the book of Psalms, and it's also a comic book character. Okay, third clue. By the th third clue, and this should really give it away to some of you adults. This, this superhero's catchphrase is, by the power of Grayskull, I have the power. Thank you. Okay, He-Man. That's He-Man. Come on, Byron. There we go, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> All right, third third character, third person. Real life person this time. Currently alive even. All right, first clue. I know, just mentioning the name. All right, first clue, this person was born on Christmas Day in 1971, and he... Look at you! <laughs> it was Justin Trudeau. Apparently, Rhonda knows his birthday, even. Look at you. <laughs> December 20th babies, he and his brother. I was, that was my next thing, was his brother was born two years later on Christmas Day. Look at you. Okay. She sends him a birthday card every yeah. year. <laughs> 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 Telling him exactly what she thinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and that's just it, right? Like, you know, if I name a fictional character or somebody greatly removed from us, it's like, Okay, that's a, that's a nice, whatever, a fun guessing game. But if I name somebody current, we immediately, like, what's my relationship to that person? And, and we laugh at the, the birthday card, right, every year? Tell you what I think, think of you. <laughs> but that's kind of the thing that happens all through the Gospels, is, is the author, authors of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are doing a bit of a guessing game with us. Who is this person, Jesus? And once we find that out, we, we immediately start asking, and what is my relationship to them? because of their identity, who they are. And so this uh, next few weeks here through the summer, as we, uh, as we get through the dog days here, I, I want us to be going, we're going through the Gospels. And each Sunday I'm going to go through one of the Gospels, and we're just going to kind of take a look at how that particular author identifies Jesus, and then what does that mean for us in relationship to him? What, what does it mean 
uh, for us to be God's children, as we were just singing about earlier. And, and what does it mean that God is our father and that, and that Jesus is his son? And so this morning, I want to look at the book of Mark. So if you've got your Bible with you, we can flip there. We're going to start right at the first verse. Um, and we're just going to kind of walk through briefly this morning a few key passages and ask this question, who is this guy that Mark is describing uh, in the gospel? And of course, if any of us... I think all of us have been in church enough at this point. It's like we, spoiler alert, we kind of already have half of an idea of who Jesus is. But I, I love having some leisure in the summer. You know, we've often we've got a little bit of time in the hammock or on a long drive or something to, to kind of reflect and think on something. And, and I'm hoping that our food for thought can be kind of reevaluating. You know, who is Jesus and what's my relationship to him? And, and then maybe doing some business that way on a personal level uh, with him. And so this week I, I'm looking at Mark and, and each week I want to encourage you, you know, it's... I picked Mark for a few different reasons, but one of them is that it's an easy place to start. In my, in my Bible with fairly big print, it's only 17 pages. That's uh, that's a fairly easy read through the week if you want to refresh yourself or, or a quick podcast, really, to listen to all 16 chapters. I'd encourage you to do that. And, and we want to come at it, hopefully, with a little bit of fresh eyes. You know, not just, okay, I'm going to you know, hear all the same familiar stuff, but maybe, maybe there's something new, something refreshing there uh, for my spirit. Because that's often what we're looking for in the summer, isn't it? You know, I want to get away, I want to relax, and I want to be refreshed. Well, let's, let's do that for ourselves in the spirit as well. So like I said, you know, for a lot of us, it's kind of, we've kind of got half an idea of who Jesus is already. And Mark, comes at us right out of the gate in verse 1. He says that the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The Messiah, of course, uh, literally means the anointed one. Uh, it was a... Um, sort of a, a role or a position that the Jews were anticipating was going to come. Uh, God was going to send somebody to deliver them from bondage, and they were anticipating this Messiah coming, a, a royal figure, as it were. And so John, Mark immediately um, identifies Jesus for us in that way. And I, and I think it's interesting that he starts there. Um, Mark is the, um, the first gospel that we're looking at this summer, but it's also chronologically, like in terms of which was written first, it was the first um, gospel to be written. At least that's as far as we can tell. That was not actually the opinion through the majority of um, church history, but in the last... 150 years or so, we've kind of come to that conclusion that Mark came first. Um, and so it, he likely published or wrote his, his uh, gospel sometime between the year 62 AD and 65, somewhere in the, the mid-60s there. Um, and we think a lot of his material actually comes from the Apostle Peter. And so because he's um, a close follower of, of, of Peter, uh, a close disciple of his, uh, we take that as a pretty reasonably reliable source of information to, to, um, to be learning about Jesus from. And you see that played out throughout the book of Mark, of course. There's a lot to do with Peter as you read through. And if you're looking, reading through it this week, keep your eye out for that. You see that Peter plays a pretty prominent role among the disciples. But Mark is the, the first gospel you'll see as we get in later. Matthew and Luke both borrow a lot of material from Mark. And that's one of the reasons why we call them synoptic gospels, those three. That they have a lot of shared material that way. Um, Mark is action-oriented. And that's another reason why it's a, it's a good one to begin with. You know, especially if we're a little ADHD in our temperament. Uh, you know, Mark keeps us moving. Uh, it's, you know, it's little vignettes along the way. And, uh, and it's always something happening. In terms of uh, percentage of content, Mark has the most material devoted to miracles. So he doesn't actually have the most miracles in any of the four Gospels, but because it's so short, most, it's almost 40% of the book is miracle stories. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's easy to keep going. And, and one of the ways Mark keeps that moving is the word immediately. Um, it's translated a bunch of different ways, of course. Um, 
depending on what translation you're reading, but you, in, in a lot of translations, you read the word immediately. You know, after this, immediately the next thing happened. And so you've got like three chapters in the middle. I think it's chapters, middle chapter four to like chapter seven. The way Mark describes it, it happens all in one day. And a lot of the other synoptic gospels, you know, s spread it out over the course of months. Uh, but M Mark is just moving us right along. And so it's, you know, it's, it, it makes for good reading that way. But Mark is also, of course, because he's taking this from Peter, Peter by this time at the end of his life is in the city of Rome in Italy, and the, the um, Roman church is being persecuted at the time. We, some of us are familiar with the emperor Nero, who um, were fairly certain purposely lit fire to the city of Rome, especially the slum, slums, so that they would all burn down, and then magically, oh, there's all this free land that we can start building public monuments on. Of course, after everything burned down, Nero isn't a very popular emperor for that reason, and so he finds, tries to find a scapegoat, and a convenient one at the time is the Christians. And that really ramps up persecution at that time. And so Mark is, is writing in the, this milieu of persecution and hostility toward the faith, and that really comes out in this gospel. We'll see a lot of Jesus suffering, and we're going to see how Jesus deals with that suffering. Now, that, I'm going to uh, try and hold myself back here because I think one of the great things uh, uh, about reading the Gospels, about encountering Jesus in the Gospels, is discovery. So I don't want to I don't want to spill all the secrets, uh, but I do want to point out a few key things that I think are important as we consider the life of Jesus as portrayed in Mark. So right away in chapter one, I said there's a lot of miracles, and his first one shows up right in chapter one. So let's read that one together. Uh, that's in chapter one, verses 21 to. 28. And as I said, as a percentage of the story, Mark has the most miracles, and so he gets right at it right away. Uh, verse 21 says, then they went to Capernaum. That's kind of Jesus' main base of operations uh, when he's not in Jerusalem or around Jerusalem. Went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. That's, that's significant. We'll come back to that. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. <laughs> not wasn't saying that to my children, but that's okay too. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Those words, be quiet, kind of stuck out there, didn't, didn't they? Jesus says this very sternly to him and casts out the demon. And so the first thing is, of course, this is a miracle. Somebody going around and casting out impure spirits doesn't happen every day. But then, interestingly, listen to Jesus' words. It's not just that he's stopping this impure spirit. Listen to what the demon says. He says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? That's his hometown. But then he goes on, he says, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now in our day, it's like Jesus' remark, be quiet, seems kind of counterintuitive. Like if you're anybody, your whole purpose is to get your name out there. You know, I, I need my brand to be well known, and I need brand recognition on all kinds of social media platforms. I mean, you look at the Kardashians, and it's like they're famous just for being famous, right? And that's, that's like a lot of people's dreams. Jesus is very cagey around his identity. The first person in the gospel to really figure out uh, who he is, Jesus says, be quiet. And, and he's trying to clamp down on, on people identifying him too quickly or too readily. And so that's a, an interesting thing as you read through the Gospel of Mark. Look for that. You know, he's often trying to suppress his own 
good PR, um, which is, I, I think is very interesting. And I think as interesting as you go through the book of Mark, Mark had, you can divide Mark really neatly up into three confessions uh, in terms of uh, how it was written. There's, of course, this first one right at the beginning in verse one, giving us an introduction. Then in the middle of the book, you have Peter's confession where he says, you are the, you know, Jesus asks, who do people say I am? And then he says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the God. That's a real hinge point in the narrative. And then right at the end, you have the centurion at the end of chapter 15, who sees everything that's happened in the crucifixion, feels the earthquake, and he says, truly, this was the son of God. And that's kind of the capstone piece to the um, whole gospel. But Interestingly, aside from there, it's almost like Mark is trying to avoid this issue of identifying exactly who Jesus is. He uses different terms, son of man, son of God, Messiah, um, just to kind of keep things rolling. And I think one of the th points is that we're supposed to discover that ourselves. We're supposed to come to our own conclusions. And that's, Mark isn't a very good evangelical that way, I, I think. You know, we, we as evangelicals, we like to tell people, what, let, you know, what's the classic line people are used to, you know, if, you, if you've ever gone door to door, it's like, do you have a minute to t talk about our Lord Jesus Christ? And people, it's like, that's, that's a key to slamming the door at that point, right? We want to lead with that, and we don't always want to maybe just be helpful in people's process of discovering who Jesus is. But Mark, I think, does that well. But they point out about Jesus, you know, as they're, the crowd is trying to figure out who this is, it says the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So that's kind of, for the people of Jesus' time, that's one of the first clues. They're rabbis, they're teachers of the law at the time, it was like, you, you wanted to be branded, you know, you wanted to have some name recognition, not for yourself, but where you went to school, who you were trained by. Um, you know, I, I think that probably the closest thing that we would have in our day is not even like ordination for pastors, but it's like, you know, who's your celebrity pastor that you're following, right? Uh, if we think a couple of years back to the pandemic, of course, in Edmonton, we had Grace Life Church, which was on the news a lot. And if, as we heard about them more, uh, if you were in the know, you heard a little bit, you'd hear a little snippet and say, well, you know, and now this American pastor, John MacArthur, is endorsing them. And for those of us in the know, it's like, as soon as I heard John MacArthur, it's like, okay, I kind of know where this person is coming from. I've never been to their church. I haven't heard a sermon. I, don't, I haven't read their website or the statement of faith. But if they're endorsed by John MacArthur, I kind of understand, you know, what the where they're coming from. And, and in Jesus' day, that was very much the case, case except more so. It, was like, it wasn't just like, okay, I understand the content of your teaching, but because you've been endorsed by Gamaliel or whoever the famous rabbi of the day was that trained you, then that, that also gave you authority to speak on that person's behalf. You could say, well, according to the teaching of this person, and that lent weight to what you have to say. And of course, Jesus comes out of nowhere. Uh, he's Jesus of Nazareth, which is like, you know, um, can, the, the common phrase of the day is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus is not formally trained by a rabbi, and yet they say he taught with authority. And that's part of the thing, I think, of why Mark is including all these miracle stories for us, is he's getting at this issue of authority. That's a big deal in the book of Mark, and, and all the Gospels, but especially Mark. He records the miracles, but even Jesus' teaching, even his confrontations with the Pharisees, they all point to this issue of authority. If you are really the Messiah, you need to prove your authority. If you're really the son of God, we need to see miracles to understand your authority. Because we get to this point of, okay, I've got some clues to identify this person. You know, there's miracles happening. But as I start to understand who this person is, I start asking, asking what is my relationship to them? You know, if I can identify them and their authority, then that's going to change how I relate to them and how they relate to me. And so asking this question of authority is essentially just saying, Jesus, are you for real? Like, is this really what's taking place? So we flip over to chapter 2. Uh, we have a story that illustrates that well. Chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 12. 
Again, another miracle story, but laced in with it is sort of this authority question. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, so he's been out, now he's back, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. That's probably a poor translation, digging through it. That, that kind of sounds like it's a thatch roof. We suspect it was probably actually tile. You could just, you know, there wasn't any insulation, of course, so you could just move the tiles apart and get in. But um, as uh, Francis Chan points out, he says, that's still not okay. Like, if, even, if you, even if you don't have a, like a really, you know, nailed down asphalt roof with insulation and, and um, drywall and everything covering that up, it's still not okay to go to your neighbors and just start taking their house apart. Like that's, that's not something that's, that you should do. So it's kind of, these guys are really desperate even to get this parallels, paralyzed man to Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, so interestingly, it's not the faith of the paralyzed man, it's the faith of the friends who are willing to start demolishing Peter's mom's house, we suspect. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, <laughs> the friends are probably a little deflated at this point. It's like, okay, we just, we just took somebody's part, house apart to bring you a paralyzed person and somehow you missed the memo, Jesus. Like, forgiveness is great, but we need him to be healed. But the, the better part, actually, is just the, the, the next part. Now, some of the teachers of the, laws, teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why did this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So there's a hint there, but it's also kind of interesting. It's like, they're just offended that somebody would say this. Here's our favorite word, verse 8. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. They praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So it's kind of an interesting question that Jesus poses them. He says, which is more difficult, to forgive somebody or to heal them? What would your answer be? It was easier to forgive somebody or to heal them. Probably easier to heal them. Okay. Why would you say that? It is difficult to forgive. It is difficult to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody's really hurt you. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes that's... I think it can go either way, in a sense, right? Because what Jesus is doing is a miracle, right? Like, I can bind up somebody's leg, and then six weeks later, it'll be better. But like you said, Brian, I would agree on some, on some level, it's difficult to forgive. I think, I think um, probably the hardest part to me of the whole Sermon on the Mount is love your enemies, right? If somebody has wronged you on purpose... Uh, and it cuts deep, it's really hard to forgive. And, and what the teachers of the law are getting at is that not only is it hard to forgive, but to take the place of God saying, God forgives you, you know, that's, that's putting yourself maybe in a place that you shouldn't be. And so Jesus says, as hard as it is to, to forgive somebody, he's kind of implying this, it's, that, that would be taking something on himself if he wasn't God. But he says, you know, because I am God, I'll heal this person instantaneously and prove that I have the authority to do that. And so this question of authority, uh, you know, it's, it's good that we wrestle with this and, and ask this question, which is, which is harder, because it's going to keep coming up through the whole book of Mark. You know, where does Jesus' authority come from? Who is he really? And it, but if we get to that point of, of realizing, okay, well, 
it seems like he really is the Messiah, the Son of God, then, then we have this question of, well, then who is he to me? You know, if we, if we know that Justin Trudeau is born on Christmas Day, 1971, that's a nice fact, but then we realize he's my prime minister now for better or for worse, and that has some effect on my life. Um, you know, we might not like laws he's getting passed. Personally, I, I like the child tax benefit that I get in, <laughs> every month in the mail, right? So there's pros and cons there, obviously. But with Jesus, we start asking, well, if he really is the son of God, if he is really the royal messiah the king not just of israel but of the whole world that means something for me that has an impact on me you know uh, princesses have principalities counts have counties jesus is a king what is his kingdom who is in his kingdom am i in his kingdom is he my king Now we we might expect it's like okay if we're if he is my king then he's going to have a bunch of rules and laws and things for me to follow and there's certainly teaching that Jesus brings us but interestingly in the book of Mark Mark there's some parables there's a bit of teaching um, some prophecy of the future chapter 13 but but most the, the, the most dramatic theme that we can seem to make out that Mark is writing about is Jesus suffering. Uh, if we flip to Mark chapter 10, we have what a lot of uh, scholars consider to be the sort of, if there's a key verse in Mark, it's in 1045, where Jesus declares, for even the Son of Man, that's one of his names for himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so suffering is sort of our third component here. We've had the miracles, the question of his authority, but then we see the suffering of Christ come through loud and clear in the book of Mark. 40% of the, the book is on the last week of Jesus' life, which is quite remarkable. Um, Mark was writing, was inventing a genre of literature at the time, of course. Gospels now are considered sort of their own um, type of writing, but at the Time, Mark was charting new territory. Um, and so uh, one scholar, uh, William Lane, describes it this way. He says, a gospel, and particularly Mark's gospel, is a historical narrative oriented around a crisis, the death of Jesus the Messiah. A historical narrative oriented around a crisis. We can say directly, you know, that probably from chapter 11 on, it's obviously explicitly about the last week of Jesus' life. But even l leading up to that, Mark has already given a lot of time and sort of airspace to Jesus predicting his death. And, and the disciples kind of being mystified by that, not understanding what's going on. But of course, again, as we mentioned, this is to Roman Christians. This is to people living in the shadow of Emperor Nero. And so they're, they're kind of taking their cues on how Jesus dealt with his suffering. He gives them rep repeated warnings about the, the crucifixion. And the disciples not really understanding why Jesus had to do that, why this was happening, or what the significance was. And that was helpful to Christians that didn't always have the answers of, why am I being treated this way? Why am I being singled out? And realizing it's okay if not everybody understands what's going on. But of course, in the final chapters of Mark, we have the description of the suffering of Christ. And I want to read um, just sort of the, a final, one of the final passages here in chapter 14, beginning at verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest and to all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, right into the, the mouth of the beast, as it were. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. This was happening in the middle of the night. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they could not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their, testi 
sorry, but their statements did not agree. So by Jewish law, you had to have at least two or three witnesses that were all kind of saying the same thing. Interestingly, that's more or less what we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as a um, reliable account. But at the crucifixion of Jesus, they didn't have that. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? That's kind of a unique term that comes up. The blessed one is actually the only way that that word is used uh, through the whole um, of Mark. It's used in other places to describe blessing and things, but never to describe God. But it's interestingly, it's it pairs well with the Messiah, the, the anointed one. Like there's no question if you answer this one that somebody's claiming to be God himself. And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes at this. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then they began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So we have the physical suffering here of Christ. But there's another element to his suffering at the time, too, and that's sort of his aloneness, his isolation in his suffering. And that comes in the next few verses. We remember, Peter's out in the courtyard. Verse 66, so while Peter was below in the car courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. And again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you are talking about. And immediately, there's our favorite word again, the rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Mark records this for us earlier. Jesus said, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Peter, who chapters earlier, had been the one to declare that you are the Christ, the Son of God, has now gone all the way in reverse and, and not just rejected Christ, but tried to distance himself as much as possible from him. Even though he's curious, you know, even though he's still in the vicinity here to find out what happens to Jesus. That's, I think, the epitome of Jesus' suffering is not just beatings and it's not just the injustice of the whole sham trial, but it's <laughs> the density of his friends, the cowardice of those who should be loyal to him, that he should be all alone at the end. But the point of Mark, of course, is not just to <laughs> make us feel bad as his, as his dense followers who don't always get what he's doing. It's to point out why did Jesus have to suffer? And he gives us, again, back in chapter 10, verse 45, he says that he was said to be a ransom for many. That he was paying the price for all of us. You know, and Mark doesn't turn a blind eye to the evil in the world. He sees you know, sickness and death all through the Gospels, people suffering from paralysis and demons. And, and Jesus comes in and he makes that right. He's setting the evil in our world back a step. He's saying, no, you, we need to turn this around. We have to, we, the world is supposed to be a good place as God created it. And I've come to redeem it and make it that again. And so Jesus suffers because it was prophesied, but he also suffers because it's a human experience. Just as the Romans were experiencing suffering, so Jesus experiences suffering in his own life and says, yeah, I know what that feels like. I've been through that. I can sympathize with everything you're going through. And I can be your high priest. I can be your connection with God. God is not distant from you. 
And of course, Mark makes that readily apparent in uh, chapter 15 when he includes the detail that that temple curtain was torn. That final piece of cloth that separated some of the priests from the very holy place in the temple where, where God was said to dwell, that was torn apart to show that that barrier was broken in the death of Jesus, that we can be his children, that we can come to him ourselves, and that he can know us. And so ultimately we see that his suffering was for us. His suffering was for us. He knows that there's evil in our world, but he also knows that there's evil in our hearts. There's sin in our hearts that separate us from God. He knows that we needed a ransom. We needed to be rescued. And so as much as we read all of the gospel and we see how Jesus is setting the world at right, we also naturally have this reaction as if we do the right thing, I think, and take it personally, we have to ask, what does that mean for me? How is Jesus relating to me in this moment as Savior, as my ransom, as, as the suffering servant who came for me? Jesus is the Son of God, yes, but he's also the suffering servant, and that's a big theme throughout Mark. The reality is that we need to be rescued. And this isn't something that we, you know, I think as evangelicals, we we sometimes say, okay, well, that's, how do I respond to it? I pray a prayer once, and then I keep on living my life um, trying to follow the rules. And it's like, no, we need the grace of Christ every day. And so I'm going to take a moment to pray. And, and if this is a new idea to you somehow, that, that you need to repent of the evil, the sin that's in your life, I'd encourage you to pray with me. This is what's called salvation. This is what's called being transferred from being an enemy of God to being one of his children. And if that's a new thing for you, that's a wonderful thing. And I'd love to talk to you more about that. But even for us that are familiar maybe with you know, this motion of the soul, I think it's good to be reminded that we need God's grace too. That, that we need continual refreshing Jesus tells us to, to pray the prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We always need forgiveness. We always need grace. And so I'd invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this morning and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Mark that recorded the story of Jesus, Lord. And we thank you most of all that we can come to you now, that it's not just an old story that we need to remind ourselves of, to put ourselves through some mental gymnastics, but it brings us face to face with your son, Jesus, and what he's done for us, Lord. And we, we do repent, Lord. And we acknowledge that even for those of us that have been walking with you for a long time as your disciples, we've still probably got mud on our shoes, even just this week. Um, in terms of sins that we've committed, or maybe good things that we've omitted. Stuff that we knew you wanted us to do and, and didn't. You know, like Peter, we can sometimes deny our place as your people. And Lord, um, we want no part of that. And we want to come to you this morning in repentance and saying, no, we want to be part of the good that you are redeeming in the world, Lord. And we want to repent of the evil that's in our hearts. And so we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would, that you would pull, pull away the punishment from our lives of that second death, Lord. Th that separation that we would have from you. That curtain that comes down between us and you that we just can't get through ourselves, Lord. We ask you to wipe that clean, to tear that curtain apart and give us free access to you. And more than that, Lord, we... we in our repentance, we want to turn around. We want to turn away from that, Lord. And we ask that you would not just cleanse our hearts away, Lord, but give us a new one, a heart that wants to seek after you, that wants to see Jesus for who he really is as our king. And we pray that you would give us the strength to follow him every day. Lord, I pray for uh, anybody in the room where maybe th this really is the good news, Lord. It's new information, new, something new to wrap our heads around, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would f fill those people today uh, and renew them each and every day as they seek to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, I'm not quite done. There, there is the weird ending to the Gospel of Mark. And by the weird ending, I mean it kind of seems like Mark doesn't finish the story. We get to verse 8. And uh, the women have just gone into the tomb and seen the risen Jesus. He's not just paid for, for our sins on the cross, but he's come back to new life. And he gives new life to his followers. And verse 8 tells us that women go and discover the empty tomb of Jesus. And it says, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So again, we've got that silence about Jesus, uh, you know, sort of the capstone piece to the gospel. And then for many of us in our Bible, we're a little confused because there's a lot of italics that comes after verse 8. Um, so there is a section to, to Mark that's added in a lot of later manuscripts, but our best, i.e. our earliest uh, copies of the gospel of Mark don't have it. Um, and we suspect it's added there because it's kind of a dissatisfying conclusion, isn't it? Um, what an ending. So there, some women went and saw that Jesus had risen from the dead, so they got really scared, ran away, and didn't tell anybody. The end. <laughs> it's kind of a weird place to tell the story, but I, or to end the story, but I think Mark actually does it um, on purpose. I will say, if you read the italics, you'll get to an interesting part where it says, the followers will handle snakes and not be poisoned. There's a rabbit hole on YouTube to go down, because that is a thing, um, but we won't get there today. Um, yeah, Evan, you, you definitely need to look that up. <laughs> Jumping around with snakes in church, it's, it's a great, great thing to behold. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Brenda's not okay with that. But, but I think Mark writes those last verses, those eight last verses of chapter 16, quite on purpose. It's, it's not, a, I don't think it's a cliffhanger of what happens. It's not supposed to be a cliffhanger to the, certainly to the original audience. They know that the Christian movement springs out of these women uh, witnessing the empty tomb. It's written to be open-ended. To say, here is, here's all the evidence. You've read the confessions even of who people seem to think Jesus is. You're left to wonder, what did these women do with the knowledge that Jesus was risen from the dead, that he was the Son of God, he was the promised Messiah. And if we wonder what they do with it, we're left to wonder, what am I supposed to do with it? Of course, as we just prayed, we want to begin with faith, obviously. We begin with belief that this really is, Jesus really is who he says he is. He is really who the Gospels declare him to be. But then what do we do with that faith? You know, if he really is that person, if I believe he is my king, what does it mean to be one of his subjects? What does it mean to be part of his kingdom? As I've been uh, praying through that, um, a, a few of you know I'm, I'm heading to speak at our favorite Bible camp up north in a couple weeks, and, and I'm kind of wrapping my head around that question of what, what does it mean to be part of Jesus' kingdom? Because it kind of turns your life upside down. There's a lot of unexpected things that come up if we, if we do that, doesn't, doesn't it? If we, if we really wholeheartedly give ourselves to Christ, it leads us in some pretty surprising directions. You know, I think of... Um, we had some friends at our at our last church. Um, th both uh, th this couple, they were both from uh, southern India, um, born born in, um, there, but then immediately immigrated when they were uh, kids, of course. But they spoke a, a language called Malayalam, and I was interested to learn that most of their region, like there's a high percentage of Christians, and as we most of us know. Um, most people in India are Hindus with a small percentage of uh, Muslims, and then Christians are a real minority, except in this one province in uh, southern India. And this is actually where we think Thomas ended up. Um, and so we, we know from church tradition that uh, the, the 12 disciples all kind of split to the four winds. Peter... Um, Peter ends up in Rome, and they're kind of all over the place. John is on the island of Patmos at the end of his life, uh, min had been ministering in modern-day Turkey. But Thomas, were, at least from church tradition, kind of heads east, and he ends up in southern India. And there's actually, um, the Indian church has a lot of, it's not scripture, but a lot of um, sort of 
traditional tales of what the miracles that Thomas did in Jesus' name in southern India. That's quite spectacular. But it's quite unexpected. You know, he's, he's kind of the odd duck out, like everybody else kind of sticks around the Mediterranean, and Thomas just heads out into this weird place. And most of us just know of Thomas as, oh, he's the guy that didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But it's obvious from the results of his life that he became convinced. He became very firmly convinced, very certain, having felt the holes in Jesus' hands, he come to a firm belief that Jesus really was the Messiah, and it led him to some interesting places. So I guess that's my question for you as you uh, maybe get the opportunity to listen to Mark through the week or, or read through it. Uh, or read through it, hopefully, with fresh eyes. Ask that question of, who is this guy? What does he mean to me? And then the really dangerous question, Jesus, what should I do with that belief? Where's that going to lead me? Where are you leading me? Maybe it's just this week. Maybe it's something really simple, a kindness to a neighbor or a stranger. Maybe it's something kind of profound that leads you out into left field in a direction not at all expected. I think we're going to close with a song now. Yep. Okay.